multiple chemical sensitivity, or MCS, is a multi-system disease that is characterized by symptoms associated with the exposure to low levels of chemical vapors. These levels of exposure are commonly found in the ambient environment. Systems that are affected by MCS include the respiratory system, the neurologic system, the gastrointestinal system, the skin in some cases. For those with less severe illness and disease, symptoms may include cough, a shortness of breath, a headache in association with exposure to chemicals on an elevator or when they open a magazine and have a scented uh, insert in the magazine. For those who are more severely affected, however, symptoms can be truly disabling. They interfere with a person's ability to engage in gainful employment. They interfere with a person's ability to use public transportation. They interfere with a person's ability to live in a multifamily housing unit. They interfere with family life. They are isolating in short so that individuals with MCS who are severely affected often feel very isolated. I see this in patients that I see at the MGH. One of the reasons for their isolation is that physicians do not get this disease. They don't understand this disease. Medical students are not taught about multiple chemical sensitivity. Physicians in training know very little about multiple chemical sensitivity or MCS. In my practice at the MGH, I'm fortunate enough to have fellows, pulmonary fellows, and also fellow, fellows in allergy and immunology who shadow me, who spend time with me in my clinic. So these fellows who are physicians in training now know about MCS. They are aware that it exists. They are able to talk to patients who have MCS. They are able to consider the diagnosis. As physicians, we apply the methodology of differential diagnosis to every patient that we see. If a patient comes in with an MCS and the diagnosis of MCS does not occur to that physician because he or she doesn't know, doesn't know about MCS, then the diagnosis will never be made. And when that happens, the patient leaves feeling more isolated than ever. Not only are family and friends uh, having trouble understanding the disease, but they don't even have a physician to whom they can go to discuss their medical symptoms. So one of the things that is very much needed in the area of multiple ch chemical sensitivity is adequate training of young physicians, adequate training of medical students, adequate training of fellows who are in specialties that are more likely to see patients with MCS. And this would include very importantly pulmonary, very importantly neurology, principal area of need is neurology, uh, gastroenterology, and allergy and immunology. The basic mechanism or mechanisms of MCS are not well understood. Consequently, there are no good diagnostic tests for MCS, which is one of the reasons that it's difficult to diagnose. Without research into this area of medicine, we will not be able to understand the basic pathophysiologic mechanisms, and we will have, continue to have great difficulty treating MCS. There are very few modalities available for treating people who have MCS. The only consistently reliable, and that doesn't mean consistently effective, but consistently reliable method of treatment, in my opinion, is avoidance of exposures. The cornerstone of treatment for individuals with MCS, in my opinion, is avoidance of exposure to the extent that that is possible. It's very difficult often to, in fact, it's impossible to achieve complete avoidance of exposure. But with careful 
planning, individuals are able to reorganize their activities of daily living so that they can decrease direct contact with chemicals. For example, if they go to the grocery store, they can avoid certain aisles where they are likely to be scented products. If they have a dentist appointment, for example, they can schedule theirs as the first appointment in the morning. For example, another thing that individuals with MCS can do is replace a gas stove with an electric stove. There are those who believe that MCS is psychogenic, that is, that it's all in the mind. Based upon my experience over the past more than 20 years taking care of patients with MCS at the Massachusetts General Hospital, I have no doubt that MCS is a physical and physiologic disease. It is not a psychogenic disease. There are often visible manifestations of disease in patients who come into my office. These include, for example, flushing of the face, swollen mucous membranes of the nose that are directly associated with exposures, in some cases increased heart rate, in some cases increased blood pressure. When these individuals are not exposed to chemicals, their skin is normal, their blood pressure is normal, and their heart rate is normal. Unfortunately, there is no laboratory test that has an MCS sign on it. You can't take a chest x-ray and diagnose MCS. You can't draw a complete blood count and diagnose MCS. And that's one of the difficulties. Hopefully, with research and improved understanding, one day we will be able to do that. But presently, it is not possible. The onset of MCS is often in association with a relatively high level chemical exposure. It can occur, however, with lower level chemical exposures. I've seen a number of patients whose disease began during the course of their work in a building or an office with inadequate ven ventilation, with poor indoor air quality. In June of 2009, the CDC put on its internal website an indoor air environmental quality policy intended to maintain good indoor air quality in buildings in which its employees worked. So among other things, the CDC policy states scented or fragranced products are prohibited at all times in all interior space owned, rented, or leased by the CDC. And this includes the use of the following products, incense, candles, or reed diffusers, fragrance emitting devices of any kind, wall-mounted devices similar to fragrance emitting devices that operate automatically or by pushing a button to dispense deodorizers or disinfectants, potpourri, plug-in or spray air fresheners, urinal or toilet blocks, other fragrance deodorizer, reodorizer products. Personal care products, including colognes, perfumes, essential oils, should not be applied at or near actual workstations, restrooms, or anywhere in CDC-owned or leased buildings. In addition, the CDC encourages employees to be as fragrance-free as possible when they arrive in the workplace. The policy states, fragrance is not appropriate for a professional work environment and the use of some products with fragrance may be detrimental to the health of workers with the following diseases, chemical sensitivities, allergies, asthma, and chronic headaches and migraines. The CDC indoor air quality policy is a very important policy and provides an example of what we should be doing in every workplace in this country. I think all workplaces should be fragrance free, the number of people who are chemically sensitive and or with diagnosed MCS is increasing on a daily basis. This problem is very similar to the problem faced by workers when smoking was allowed in the workplace. The implementation of a smoke-free workplace policy by the Occupational Safety and Health Administration and other regulatory agencies has been very important in preserving the health of workers in those workplaces. 
Since the smoke-free policy has been implemented in workplaces, we found out much more about the toxic effects of secondhand smoke. I think the same thing is true with regard to the toxic effects of chemical vapors. There are a number of vulnerable individuals in the workplace, not only those with MCS. And I think that as a matter of public health policy, we have a responsibility to protect all of those workers. A fragrance-free policy allows those individuals who are chemically sensitive to continue their employment. As a result, they do not have to turn to Social Security disability for income. Those who are not the beneficiaries of a fragrance-free policy are often unable to work and do find themselves on Social Security disability. In addition, the CDC policy encourages or requires advance notice if new chemical products are going to be introduced into the workplace or if renovation work or installation of new carpeting is to, is, is to be carried out in the work environment. This practice would enable people with MCS and with other chronic diseases such as asthma, allergies, chronic obstructive lung disease to make other arrangements while the renovation work is going on, for example, or the new carpeting is being installed. It also would allow them to discuss with their supervisors new chemicals that are being introduced in, into the work environment because often people who are chemically sensitive have knowledge of alternatives that are less toxic, not only for them but also for other people who may be affected. Because many practicing physicians, most practicing physicians, do not understand MCS, patients who have MCS feel as if they are not heard by their physicians, and in fact, they are not heard by their physicians. As a result, they seek alternative methods of care. They seek alternative types of healthcare practice, alternative types of practitioners. In many cases, these alternative therapies actually do more harm than good, so that great care needs to be taken in advising MCS patients with regard to treatment. And as I have said, in my opinion, the only treatment that has been shown to be effective at the present time is avoidance of exposure to the extent that that is possible. Patients with MCS and physicians who may be treating them need to remember that if it's too good to be true, it probably is too good to be true. There are no miraculous cures out there, at least none that I know about. Patients with MCS travel great distances, sometimes to receive what is touted as a miracle cure. They spend lots of money to receive this so-called miracle cure, and in the end, it is not a miracle cure it often makes symptoms worse rather than better and at the end of the day it does not cure the disease until we better understand the pathophysiologic mechanisms we're not going to be able to do much better than avoidance of exposures in my opinion and to better understand the pathophysiologic mechanisms we need funded research in this area a principal concern, a principal problem for many of the patients that I see at the Massachusetts General Hospital is housing. Individuals who are moderately or severely affected by MCS ideally need a single family home, ideally need a two bedroom home if they are living alone so that they have a safe place to go if fragranced products are inadvertently brought into their home. Multifamily dwellings are problematic because of common areas where scented products are often used, because of neighbors who use scented products, who burn scented candles. Um, scented products are used to clean the common areas. So multifamily dwellings are, are really very difficult, and this limits the housing availability for people with, with MCS. They have to be able to afford a single family dwelling, for example. 
and many people, because they are not able to work as a result of their disease, don't have the financial resources to buy or rent a single family dwelling. So it's a major problem for my patients. I have had patients who have lived in HUD subsidized housing, have made their housing acceptable for them only to have the subsidies withdrawn so that they didn't then have to go out and find another place to live. So uh, it's something that those of us without MCS don't think about very much, but for people with MCS, it's a major life problem. Hello, I'm Allison Johnson, and I would like to read for you passages from my book titled Amputated Lives, Coping with Chemical Sensitivity. I would like to begin with a preface. All my books and documentaries have had a central goal in mind, to convince readers and viewers that chemical sensitivity is real and is devastating far too many lives. In the 10 years that have passed since I have produced and directed my first documentary, Multiple Chemical Sensitivity, How Chemical Exposures May Be Affecting Your Health, more and more people have been succumbing to this condition. Hardly a day goes by that I do not hear from someone who is close to despair because they see their former life slipping away from them as they struggle with a condition that the medical profession has largely ignored. Last month, a taxi cab driver from Las Vegas emailed to say, I was making good money driving a taxi and had to resign because the other driver would spray it with air freshener. Eventually, the cab made me so sick I had to quit. Another email came from a New York City police detective who toiled for months in the World Trade Center cleanup and is now too sick to work. He has become extremely sensitive to cleaning products, fragrances, and diesel exhaust and summed up his condition by saying, I am beyond miserable. An artist who found it enormously difficult to find a place to live that she can tolerate expressed her frustration by writing, in the search for a new home, I came to know full well an overwhelming feeling of desperation. And along with that desperation came the growing conviction that the chemically sensitive are viewed as throwaway people. In part two of my book, People who are chemically sensitive describe in their own words how this has changed their lives forever. I've also used extensive quotes from these individuals in part one instead of filtering their experience through my own words. It is my hope that this book will persuade readers that those unfortunate enough to have developed multiple chemical sensitivity are not throwaway people, but the proverbial canaries in the mine alerting us that the rapid proliferation in chemical products in our environment may be endangering all of us. My introduction begins this way. Four cataclysmic events have rocked the United States in the last two decades. The 1989 Exxon Valdez oil spill, the 1991 Gulf War, the destruction of the World Trade Center in 2001, and Hurricane Katrina in 2005. At first glance, these events might seem to have little in common, but all left in their wake significant numbers of people who are now chronically ill after exposure to large amounts of toxic chemicals. Chemicals and the products in which they are found constitute an important part of our economy, and they make our lives easier in so many ways. Many of these chemicals, however, are toxic, and the government has tested and regulated only a small percentage of them. People who develop chemical sensitivity began to react to chemicals they encounter in everyday life in substances like perfume, paint, gasoline, diesel exhaust, cigarettes, smoke, cleaning products, new carpets, pesticides, and air fresheners. Continuing with passages that I wrote in my introduction, one of the most distinctive features of MCS is that people who develop the condition began to react to low-level chemical exposures that never bothered them previously. Some MCS patients have only mild cases. For others, the condition can be life-threatening. People with MCS can have a wide variety of symptoms as a result of chemical exposures, with different patients having different symptoms. A given patient, however, will usually have the same symptom in response to a given exposure, perhaps getting a headache after exposure to paint, 
or getting arthritic pains after exposure to natural gas. Change comes very slowly in huge government bureaucracies, but Dr. Ronald Blank, who was the U.S. Army Surgeon General and the commander of Walter Reed Army Medical Center during much of the 1990s, was one leader who began to question the stress theory that assumed that the illnesses suffered by so many returning veterans were psychologically based. In my documentary, Gulf War Syndrome, Aftermath of a Toxic Battlefield, the 2004 version, Dr. Blank states, and I quote, in the mid-1990s, I commanded Walter Reed Army Medical Center. I continued to work on looking for causes for the illnesses suffered by many Gulf War veterans, illnesses that were clearly more than stress-related. I looked at vaccines. I looked at exposure to smokes, to other toxic chemicals, petrochemicals, and so forth, all that were part of that battlefield experience. And I came to the conclusion that at least one of the explanations was multiple chemical sensitivity, something where a variety of toxic elements, even at low levels by themselves, in combination may in susceptible individuals be causing these illnesses. And I believe that so much more work needs to be done on that, but it is clearly one of the explanations. Although there's been increased recognition that there are other causes than stress for these illnesses, really the sea change happened in the last year or so and is highlighted by an article in the New York Times of October 15, 2004, that states many of the old veterans suffer from neurological damage caused by exposure to toxic chemicals. Newspaper conditions often refer to multiple chemical sensitivity as a rare condition, but this is hardly the case. In 2004, the Archives of Environmental Health published a national prevalence study by Stanley Kress and Ann Steinemann. These researchers reported that in their national random phone survey, 2.5% of the respondents said that they had been diagnosed with MCS. This result suggests that over 7 million Americans may be suffering from multiple chemical sensitivity, a number that exceeds the population of Massachusetts. This is hardly a rare condition, as it is frequently termed in the media. The potential for MCS to gradually increase a person's sensitivity to the point that he or she can't find a workplace that can, can be tolerated leads to a situation in which large numbers of chemically sensitive people eventually end up with no choice but to turn to public assistance like SSI, Social Security Supplemental Income. This is yet another reason why the medical profession and government bodies should turn their attention to a condition that has the potential to be a huge drain on public finances. It's hardly surprising that industry doesn't want anyone to believe that chemical exposures could produce a debilitating condition like MCS. The consequences for corporations would be enormous if members of the public increasingly began to wonder if installing new carpet, using pesticides in their house or yard, or buying particle board cabinets or furniture might affect their health. And imagine the potential liability problems if people could prove that exposures in factories hospitals, schools, or offices had destroyed their health. To understand the power that industry wields regarding MCS, one need only remember that the tobacco industry managed for decades to keep the public from recognizing the hazards of smoking. They were able to succeed in this agenda not only by funding research that would encourage people to think that smoking was safe, but also by discouraging any research that might show the dangers of smoking. If the tobacco industry, which represents a very small fraction of American business, could exercise so much power, it is indeed staggering to consider the influence against validating MCS that is wielded by corporations when almost every business in the United States is significantly involved in chemical use in one way or another. What advertiser would want to run ads on a TV show that raised the possibility that chemical exposures could be creating serious illness? Certainly not advertisers from the cosmetic, pesticide, construction, or carpet industries. The next passages that I would like to read from Chapter 3, The Consequences of Disbelief, concern suicide or suicide attempts. Now, I realize that suicide is a topic people really shy away from discussing. It's almost a taboo topic in our subject, but there are times we really must address it in order to save lives in the future. Continuing reading from my chapter on the consequences of disbelief, 
Sue, who suffers from extreme chemical sensitivity, did give up on life on two occasions, both directly related to the great difficulty she had experienced trying to find a safe place to work and to live. In her story in part two, she describes in poignant terms the despair that drove her to try to take her own life, even though she had a very supportive husband who loved her very much. In her story, she relates the enormous sense of frustration she felt when physicians, friends, and family viewed her symptoms with skepticism. One particularly tragic example of the fact that disbelief can indeed sometimes kill appears in an email that I recently received from Anne McCampbell, MD, a board member of My Chemical Sensitivity Foundation. She has written a very useful educational booklet on multiple chemical sensitivity. Dr. McCampbell wrote, a woman named Rachel had called me a couple of weeks ago and wanted to order 50 of my booklets. When I called back to say they were ready to ship, a woman answered the phone and said that Rachel was deceased, had hung herself about a week ago. I am racking my brain to remember what she might have told me about her situation. I know she wanted booklets to try and increase awareness of and sympathy towards chemical sensitivities, but I don't remember the details. It's clear that Rachel was so concerned about the disbelief she was encountering that she was willing to spend a considerable amount of money on booklets to try to counter this disbelief. Rachel's tragic death and Sue's two suicide attempts show that there are many ways to assist in suicide. Dr. Jack Kevorkian was strongly condemned for assisting in suicide. Unfortunately, many physicians, employers, family, and friends are in effect assisting in suicide through their disbelief. In 1996, I happened to hear somewhat by chance that in the same three week period that year, two chemically sensitive people took their own lives and another woman with MCS ended up in the hospital with a failed suicide attempt. A number like this must unfortunately be only the tip of a dismaying iceberg. When I asked in my 1996 survey of 351 people with MCS if the respondents had heard of MCS suicides, I received reports of dozens of such suicides. One sometimes hears reporters or people in the medical profession say somewhat glibly that no one ever dies of multiple chemical sensitivity. Would these same people say that no one ever dies from bipolar disease, which has a significant mortality rate from suicide? 12 years as an advocate for the chemically sensitive has led me to the sad realization that a large number of chemically sensitive people have taken their own lives and many others are inching ever closer to that decision because they find it such a daunting task to locate a safe place to live or work and are rapidly running out of money. And at the same time that they're engaged in this Herculean struggle, far too many of them are facing a discouraging skepticism from those about them.